I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, we're diving into a wonderful book. It is called Saying Thanks and Be and it's written by a terrific author, one of my favorite guests, Ralph Mosgrove. This insightful book explores two simple words, thank you, and how they can go even further to impact someone's life in a powerful way. If you've ever wondered how small acts of kindness can truly change the world, stay tuned as we explore the wisdom within these pages. We're delighted to have this very talented author join us once again here today on Spotlight. We thank the team at Books to Life Marketing for helping us put him in the spotlight today. And we ask viewers like you to support authors like him by subscribing to our channel and by purchasing his amazing book. The links are below this interview. Ralph, welcome back to Spotlight. Thank you so much for joining me here today. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Oh, it's my pleasure. Great to have you on the show once again. This all began with um, your wife, really, with Elsie falling and becoming injured and becoming partially disabled. Tell us a little bit about that story, about how you witnessed the kindness of strangers during your hard time. Yes, uh, she would often approach a building and you go for, for the door to be opened. And I was with her and I was ready to open the door, but people would step up out of the community right there where we were, they would open the door for her. And oftentimes she would say to me, what more can I say to these people other than thank you? Because it seems so trite for the kind act they do for me. I said, well, add a little phrase to it. Something like, oh, I'm so glad you came along or that really timed, that just was the right timing or something like that. And so those acts of kindness caused her to reevaluate what she, how she responded to them. And that response carries forward into their, their life as well as in ours as well. And that motivated me to write the book for her after she passed away in 2015. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, instead of saying thank you, which can sound perfunctory after you say it a bunch of times, to say something a little bit different, like, oh, that's so kind of you, or you were right in the right spot at the right time, I appreciate that, or have a blessed day, I appreciate your kindness. It shows that you're thinking about what could be on their part a routine act, but it also empowers them as well, don't you think? It encourages them to want to do it more, to be more kind to people. And then, of course, that carries on from the person who receives it to add, add that same kind of kindness to somebody else. So they're passing it on from both ends. Exactly, exactly. You joined us once before. You explained what happened to your wife and her injury, but... Perhaps the folks watching today didn't see that interview. So could you kindly tell us what happened to your wife and how she became uh, partially disabled? She was uh, working as a receptionist for an assisted living facility. And she went to answer a telephone in another office. And as she turned to go to that phone, she stumbled and fell and broke her hap, hip, right hip, and crushed two vertebrae in her back. And it disabled her so that she had to use a walker wherever she went. To stabilize herself and it was because of that walker that these people stepped up out of the shadows and offered her help at a time of her need amazing amazing how old was she when she fell like that three wow amazing well um i hope she didn't suffer too much um and it did ex open up a different side of life for you guys in one way where you got to see the kindness of people because uh sometimes people think Folks aren't that neighborly. But when you are in distress, that's when you see the best in people, don't you think? So, because it, it causes people to step forward and do something that they naturally would, would want to do. It's not something that you're trained for, something that you just feel in your, on your inner being. I believe it's a God-given gift of grace that they extend to someone who they see is in need and they want to help them. Exactly. And the first time I think you witness that grace is when you're in the medical facility, when you're treated so kindly by the nurses and the aides and the doctors who see pain and suffering all day long, but they're so attuned to yours. I, I really feel like I'm surrounded by angels sometimes when I'm in the hospital. That's right. I call these people secret, unidentified secret agents of God. <laughs> they step up woodwork and, and they never you don't never see them again but here they are doing something in your life stopping their life to help your life go on continue 
Exactly. And they're, they're doing it on 12 hour shifts, you know, overnight shifts, early morning shifts, Christmas, you know, it doesn't matter. They're there working to help you in your time of need. And I really like that. Unid unidentified agents of God. That's right. I think you should trademark that. I think that's a good one. That's for sure. Yeah. Give us an overview of the book, if you would, Ralph. Yes, I start out by say, giving the example of the r ripple effect, which I refer to as dropping a pebble in a pond where the ripples go out to the shoreline and they bounce back to where the ripple began. And the same thing is true in the life of the individual that gives a, a gift of kindness. That gift goes out beyond the the, the, the present uh, atmosphere. And by saying some word of encouragement to somebody, it causes them to want to repeat their act of kindness. And what goes out comes back the same way. I tell a story about Johnny who was playing in the meadow. And he was just dancing around, calling out and having a lot of good time out there in the sunshine. And he heard a little boy in the woods uh, saying something to him. So he called out and he said, come out, little boy, I want to play with you. And the little boy answered, come out, little boy, I want to play with you. And he tried that several times and the boy would not come out. So he went home and complained to his mother that there was a little boy in the woods that was mocking him and, and making fun of him and he wouldn't come out and play with him. She said, no, Johnny, that's not a little boy, that's your echo. You see, whatever you say goes out and it comes back to you the same way you say it. And so that happens, and that's true in the life of every person. Sometimes people are mean spirited, and they develop more mean spirited responses from other people as well. So the ripple effect carries out into a, a beyond. You know, you never know where that's going to end. Yeah. Whatever you put out into the universe generally comes back to you. If you put out goodness, if you put out kindness, I think you receive goodness, you receive kindness. If you go out there with a head of steam, you go out there suspicious of everyone, feeling that they've got bad intentions, well, that's what you're going to see. So I think right. we we choose what kind of glasses, what kind of uh, focus, right? I give illustrations in the book about how these uh, attitudes change the lives of people. Uh, there's a part of the book that talks about the uh, manager of a large business who was having a chauffeur drive him around. And the car, the chauffeur seemed to be having a lot of trouble with the car and the driver just was unhappy with him. Um, the owner was. And uh, he said to his wife, I'm just going to have to let that guy go. I just can't see him driving me around. He's very reckless on the road. And she said, well, why don't you give him another chance? She said, do something for him to make him more comfortable. Well, he thought about that, and he went out and bought a new car for this driver, and the driver drove a lot better because he had something more comfortable for him to drive, and he felt like he was being respected by his owner. And as a result of that, they became fast friends, and the owner realized that he had been too harsh on the individual, and when he showed a better attitude toward him and provided a better car for him, they had a better result. Exactly, exactly. Showing people respect, showing that you value their work, that you value their contributions, that you value them as a person right. is in, is invaluable. I mean, as far as getting a positive response out of people. And it's not manipulative either. If you're truly showing kindness, that's when people appreciate it. If you're just giving lip service, I think people can read through that as well, don't you think? Right. It's important to speak up because when you do, you say things to people that encourage them. And as you encourage them, they become encouraged to go out and do it again and also pass that on to the next person. And that that that, sort, that just sort of develops a, an attitude of a lifestyle of saying thanks and beyond, going out beyond doing it more than just the, the two words of saying thanks. And so by speaking up, you encourage that person to do it again and again. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're reinforcing the positive behavior, without a doubt. So tell us a little bit more about what's in the book. You have the story about the echo. You have the story about the chauffeur. Tell us a little bit more of what we'll find within the pages of this book. Well, I have different stories, different examples that I use. Like, for example, I've observed a woman who was in a wheelchair and she was trying to get her grocery shopping done in front of these automated carts. And uh, as she was looking on the shelf, trying to determine what she wanted, there was a young couple that came along 
And they just reached over her and grabbed what they wanted and kept on going. Never said, excuse me, never offered any help. Can I help you find something? Or what, what, what are you looking for? They didn't offer any help at all. When they finished their little task, I went up to her and I said, is there something I can do to help you? Can I help you find something on the shelf? She said, yes, I'd like that, that bottle up there on the top shelf. I can't reach it. So those are the kinds of examples that I see happening all the time. People don't take time to respect other people. They, they want to get their own way first, and they seek after their own, their own ideas and their own attitudes. But the, if they'll take a moment to say, excuse me, uh, can I help you for something? Uh, or is there something I can get for you? It only takes a moment. And you've, you've encouraged that person that's disabled, and, and you're doing something to encourage them and, and make them feel better about themselves. And you feel better about yourself because you've taken time to be kind to someone. Absolutely. Absolutely. You have to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. If they're in a wheelchair, if they have a walker, if they have a cane, or even if they just look kind of glum today. If you say to them, how's your day? How are you doing? You know, it's amazing the answers you'll get sometimes. They'll say, well, not very good, actually, this morning, so forth and so on. Yeah. So the book gives illustrations of how people can be kind and what they can do to help uh, be kind. Of mother, mother was in the doctor's office and she saw a woman coming into the doctor's office with a, a walker, um, a stroller with a baby in it, and another two or three year old boy with her. And they were struggling to get the door open to get the walk, the, uh, the stroller in and the, and the, the children in. And uh, the mother's 10-year-old boy they were waiting in the waiting room saw that struggling going on, and immediately the boy jumped up and held the door for the woman so she could get in. Yeah. And that's the kind of thing that spreads good news, and, and, and people respond to that. Uh, I, I believe that the word kindness comes out of the scriptures that Jesus used or the, that Paul used in writing the book to Galatians. And in chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, it says that kindness is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That when we turn our life over to Christ and we trust him, those acts of kindness, those gentle spoke moments, those moments of self-control uh, are gifts that God gives us so that we can be a, an instrument to someone else, cause them to be kind and act in, in gentle ways with people that need help. Absolutely. I mean, an expression we use a lot today is what would Jesus do? So if you can try to be Christ-like in your actions, um, in your words, um, I think it goes obviously a long way because there's no better example for both the divine and humanity as well, right? Right. Yeah. It's interesting, Ralph. I heard a great story one time. A man is sitting on the subway and he witnesses children out of control while the father is completely aloof. And uh, he waits a few minutes, waits a few more minutes. And finally, he says to the father, could you please get these children under control? Can you please? They're annoying everyone on this train. And the man said, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's just been a difficult day. Uh, they lost their mother this morning. And at that moment, the person who went to chastise the dad for not being a good father was crestfallen because he didn't realize that other person's point of view what the other person was going through. So sometimes you just don't realize what people are going through and you need to have a little heart. You need to have a little empathy. You need to be Christ-like, like you said. Right, well, patience is kind. You have to have patience with people because you don't know what their background is. You don't know what they're struggling with when you meet them. But out of your patience and kindness to them, you soften their struggle so that they, they realize there's something better to live for than they don't have to be too downcast. They can find a way to get out of that. And you encourage them in their, their time of sorrow and sadness. Absolutely. And as I understand it, you've had a life of service as well. Tell us a little bit about your background, Ralph. Yes, I was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio, and went to a our Nazarene Church College in Boston area. And then I joined the Navy and spent 26 years services in the military service. Um, at the age of 40, I was praying and asking the Lord what I should do when I retired from the military. And he said, I want you to prepare for the pastoral ministry. And I was surprised by that. Even though I'd been very active in the church, uh, I was a church musician for church music of almost for 40 years. And... Uh, 
while I was praying about that, and he said to, to prepare for the pastoral ministry, I, I thought, well, I, I've given my life to you, Lord, and so if that's what you want me to do, I'm willing to do that. And I prepared, took additional courses in theology because I had majored in music. And uh, when I finished those two courses, I was ordained in the Church of the Nazarene in 1975. I took a little church and I stayed in that pastorate for, for 25 years. And when I retired, I went to work for the McNeil Air Force Base Chapel and became their music director and sometimes filled in for the pastor when the chaplains were away or had, had to be called out. After 12 years of that, my wife's health broke and I took care of her for two years until she passed away. And then that little church that I had pastored for 25 years said, would you come back and help us with music? Because our pastor knows nothing about music. I said, sure, I'll take it. I'll do what I can. After four years or five years with him, he said, I'm getting ready to resign. Would you take the church? I said, sure. I said, if, uh, if the district superintendent approves it, I've said, I'm 85, Ed. You know, I'll, I'll do the best I can for as long as I can. Well, I just celebrated my 90th birthday last July of 24. And uh, I re resigned the church after five years of pastoring it again all around. And so here I am. I'm still busy working with the Salvation Army on Sunday mornings in their worship service. I play the organ. I have our own church worship service that now has a different pastor. And I support her with music. Uh, and uh, that's at 2 o'clock on Sunday afternoons. And then I play for a retirement community in the evenings in their Vesper service for the uh, residents in the community. So I have a busy Sunday, and then all week long, I'm finding ways to help other people do kind acts of kindness. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. That's an amazing career, from being in the armed services to working in the ministry to basically being, you know, a volunteer in the ministry as well, and then becoming a pastor again at 85. That's really quite amazing. I did that for five years until I had my 90th birthday, and I decided it was time to give it up and take a little rest. <laughs> Well, I don't think you're resting because you're busy now writing books and spreading the word of the Lord that way, which I think is important as well. Um, what was it like going back to the ministry uh, and giving um, sermons again on Sunday and being connected with the congregation once again like that? Well, it was an opportunity for me to show the kinds of lifestyle that I want other people to live. Uh, as I would preach, I would give them an opportunity to turn their life over to Christ. And and uh, anything that causes that to happen is a joyful moment. In my writing, as I attended through OSHA with the University of South Florida, um, I was asked to take an assignment of writing something on the word joy. The whole class had that opportunity. And so different people come up with different ideas. But I concluded my poem that I wrote. Uh, about joy, that the thing that gives me the most joy is knowing that I've helped someone else find the Lord in their life. And yeah. that's, that's the way I feel in all of my attitudes for my ministry. Uh, my goal is to bring Christ into their life and have them change their life. Mm. And I've resolved many times over and over. Amazing. Amazing. Tell us a little bit about the church. What was the name of the church? Where was it located? Tell us about the congregation. Yes. It is a small church in the city of St. Petersburg, Florida. It's called the Lillman Church of the Nazarene, named after Mr. Lillman, who developed that neighborhood back in the 50s. And First Church of the Nazarene in the center of St. Petersburg City <clears throat> saw a need to add a, 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 develop a church in that new community. So they had five families that went out and began to build the church and build the community and bring people into the church. And they had a history of uh, over 20 years before I came to them, and most of the pastors were there for very short terms. Mm. And I, being military and had an income from my retirement, told the church that they would not need to pay me anything as long as they carried themselves and paid their bills and, and responded to their uh, responsibilities to the district church, a larger church and general church, which is uh, headquartered in Lenexa, Texas, our general headquarters. And um, as a result of that, uh, I, I had over 2,500 people come through the doors of our little church in the 25 years that I was there. It still remains a small church. I had an average attendance of 83 for uh, two years in a row. And church plantings uh, rules say that you, can re you cannot retain more than 80% of your seating capacity. And it's because the church hall 
we had a larger in, in ministry outside the walls of the church. And today we do the same thing. We offer, I have a the, uh, pastor of the church that is there now is a licensed clinical social worker, has a master's degree in social work and is working on her doctorate in theology. She's uh, preparing herself for the leadership of the church and be ready to be ordained hopefully by another year from now when she finishes her studies. And um, as a result, we have people that come to us out of homelessness, out of uh, a need for getting their ID cards established or a place to live, get off the streets. I have literally taken six families and purchased their mobile home for them. And they paid me back out of their income, of their disability income. They were able to maintain their rent and pay me back. I never lost a penny in the investment that I made. I never charged them an interest on it. They simply paid back what I gave them. They have lived, they're living those uh, mobile homes today and they are a part of the church, but we have an impact in the neighborhood that takes our message beyond the walls of our church. So we have an average attendance of anywhere from 15 to 20 people on Sundays, but we do the ministry to over 100 people throughout the week. Yeah, I think that's wonderful. I think it's, you know, there's nothing more valuable, I think, than helping people put a roof over their heads because that's the foundation of life, basically. You need a roof over your head and then you can have a, a sustained marriage. You can have a family. Uh, you can have all the things that people want out of this life. So that was truly kind of you out of your own funds to help people um, purchase those homes. Well, Elsie left an estate I and mean, there were funds that were, that were extra money that I could use. And I used that to help other people get on their feet. And as a result of that, they ch it changed their life completely. Amazing. Amazing. It's beautiful work, Ralph. So thank you for that. Uh, tell us what you do now with the um, Salvation Army. I'm the organist for their morning worship service. And mm -hmm. then I participate in your Bible studies and uh, their different programs at the church, support the pastors that are there, uh, and, and help people that need to help along with Salvation Army's uh, social service departments. I have a, a, a disabled veteran that I work with. It's a Sa Salvation Army soldier. And he's very uh, needy and has a lot of uh, needs in his life. And so I've taken him under my wing and I've become his power of attorney to help him be able to live in an assisted living facility and uh, to help him with his finances and work with him so that he has a better life. Amazing. You know what? All many people know about the Salvation Army are those sidewalk Santas at Christmas time. Tell us a little bit more about what the Salvation Army does to help people in their lives. Well, they, they have a food bank, <clears throat> for one thing, and people that are hungry and they need, need food items can go to the Salvation Army and pick up food for their needs. Uh, there are many different organizations in the city of St. Petersburg that do the same thing. But people are drawn to certain areas and certain places where they are, are welcomed. And uh, the Salvation Army doesn't require anything in return. They accept them for whoever they are without any judgment or measurement of what they're all about, what their background is. And so as a result of that openness, they have a lot of people that come and seeking out and, and, and different social service needs. Uh, sometimes they need uh, a bus pass or, or some uh, reason to have to have some financial help to pay off it that's come in. And so those, those areas of the salvation are, are helpful. And when there's a disaster time, of, like we've had in our hurricanes these, the last few months, uh, Salvation Army takes a service truck out into that community and serves hot meals to people that are in need, offers water and encouragement and prayer for them in that time. And so they have a, they have a great ministry that's worldwide. And uh, I'm just part of a little cog in, the spot, in a big wheel. Yeah. Well, you're doing your part being that cog in the big wheel by uh, playing music, which I think is certainly... Um, inspiring and a connection to God. There's something about going into a church and hearing the organ that makes you feel like you're in a sacred place, right? I, I think so. And I like to feel that when I'm playing that organ, I'm playing it for the Lord and people will respond to that. They'll hear that and they'll, they'll, they'll want to serve the Lord. They have a desire to be in the house of God, be close to him. Yeah. One of my fondest memories of going to church as a young child, I guess it was, was on Easter Sunday, we would leave the church and they'd be playing Jesus Christ has risen today, hallelujah. 
And I still feel that way on Christmas, on Easter morning, rather. Uh, Jesus Christ is risen today. Alleluia. Um, it really just, music is part of worship, and it's an integral part of it. Right. Yeah, yeah. it is. I, I, I play for the Vesper service, and the people there appreciate the music that I play. Uh, I studied organ while I was in college and learned the classical organ music. But as a organist, after a period of time, and I played for many churches, uh, I felt that my music is, would, would be better suited to an evangelistic style. And so I, I, I play the classical music when I need to, but I, most of my music is done in an evangelistic style. It's a little different than just the classics like Brahms and Bach. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, I'm going to have to stop by the Salvation Army one Sunday and listen to you play when I'm down in the Tampa St. Pete area, that's for sure, and say hello to you and wish you a belated uh, happy birthday, without a doubt. Before we go, let's talk about your years. You were in the Navy, correct? Tell us about your years in the Navy and how that helped form the person you are today. Well, I, when I joined the Navy, I felt it was a... Um, the reason to serve Christ through the Navy and to help men, men and women who uh, were living for the Lord when they were home under the influence of their parents. But when they got away in independent living and they were doing their own thing, they often drifted away from the Lord. And my, I felt that I was a missionary to service men and women. And I would help, help them. I would, went into personnel work. I became the chaplain's assistant to, when I was aboard ship. I was enlisted status. And I stayed with that for uh, uh, 12, 13 years. And my son was born in Nor Newport News, uh, the Norfolk area, and he had a lot of allergies as a child, was very low in the gamma globulin and had a lot of infections. And so we had a lot of medical problems with him. Hmm. And then they transferred me to Arizona for a special armed forces project with all military services working together. And out of that, I decided to get out of the Navy and stay there because his health changed completely when we got into the dry climate. And then I took a job at recruiter for the veterans to help veterans join the Naval Reserve if they didn't want to stay for a full-time career. And many of, them, many of them would then join the reserve program so they could draw their benefits at the age of 60. And eventually the Lord moved me from Tucson, Arizona to Jacksonville, Florida, then to St. Petersburg, Florida. And I retired from St. Petersburg with 26 years of active service. The last wow. five years of active duty, I was working as a pastor as well as we were working in recruiting. So I was Bible occasional. Amazing, amazing. 26 years uh, in the Navy. Uh, you retired in 1975, you mentioned? 1980. I retired in 1980 as a senior chief petty officer. Okay. Hard to believe that was 44 years ago now, right? I hear you. I know. it. And you had a whole other life in between, which I think is wonderful. You had your life in service to America, and then you had your life in service to God. I think all it has been in service to God, no doubt. But uh, certainly there's this dichotomy there, and uh, you have filled the time perfectly. Is your son nearby? Does he live anywhere near St. Petersburg today? Out of Tampa in a small town called Brandon. It's a growing town that's on the south edge of Tampa, part of the uh, major city. Sure, I know it. It's a beautiful town. He's not very far from you at all, which is great. Yeah. I stayed with him during the hurricane, so my house would not, I would not be here in my house by myself. Great. Did you go to Brandon during the hurricane? I stayed with him at Brandon. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Well, you took care of him. And now he's taking care of you sometimes as well, which is great as well. But you don't need any taking care of. You're in great shape, Ralph. I look forward to celebrating your 100th birthday with you in the next decade. And I'm sure you're going to accomplish a lot over those 10 years um, because you've accomplished a lot in your 90 years so far, 90 years young. The name of the book we've been talking about today is Saying Thanks and Beyond. It's written by Ralph Mosgrove. It is an insightful book that explores how two simple words, thank you, can go even further to impact someone's life in a powerful way. If you've ever wondered how small acts of kindness can truly change the world, stay tuned as we explore the wisdom within 
these pages. And we have done so today with the author himself, Ralph Mosgrove. Ralph, thank you so much for joining me here today on Spotlight. I'm glad I was able to do it. Great to have you on the show once again. And to the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time this time until next time on Spotlight.